Good morning. Good to see you here this morning, Grace Church. My name is Gary. I'm one of the elders here at Grace. We're pleased to have each of you here to worship this morning. As we come together, it's an opportunity for us to encourage one another and to be challenged to think about life outside of ourselves, to recognize that we come to worship a great God who rules the universe and rules our lives. Sometimes we uh, fail to give proper thought to that. So as we gather this morning, we want to turn our, our thoughts and our minds to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who gave himself for us. We enter this uh, Easter season, Easter's last Sunday of this month, in which we celebrate and remember his death for us. It's good that you're here. Let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you as we sing this morning that you are a God of wonders. Maybe the greatest wonder of all is that you loved us, that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die for us, that you've redeemed us, and that you uh, set us up on solid ground that we might live lives that are pleasing to you. We're thankful for the opportunity to come into your presence this morning and ask that as the music team leads us in worship and as Pastor John opens your word to us that we will see you, we will interact with you, and we'll know at the end of this morning that we have been in your presence. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, the heavens are your tabernacle, glory to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth. Early in the morning, I will celebrate the I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by night, God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy, the universe declares your majesty, you are holy. You are holy, holy, precious Lord, reveal yourself to me. Father, hold me, hold me, universe declares your majesty. To the Lord. 
Good morning. Good morning again. Good to see you all on this beautiful spring day, but winter's still around for another two and a half weeks according to the calendar, so I wouldn't put the snow shovels away just yet. But let's be optimistic and, uh, and hope that this is spring making an early arrival. Uh, several announcements this morning. Start with the Connect card, which we typically point out. And this is more than just a formality, it's an opportunity for us to keep in touch with you. If you're a longtime member, if there's been a change, your address, email, phone number, we'd love to know that. If you're a new person, new join, new here for the first time, we'd love to have you fill one out so we can uh, get to know who was here with us today. Um, they're on the table over there. You can get one on your way out, or it's online at our, at our website, Granger, 
graceforgranger.org. Um, next to Bible studies, we've got Bible studies coming up, uh, men's and women's, beginning next week, not this week, but the following week, March 12th, the men's will begin. And um, it'll be on Wednesday evenings in room, all, all of these will be in room 318, which is around the outside of the gym over in that corner, I believe. So uh, you won't get lost if you come in the building and go that way. So uh, the men's is, is on Tuesday evenings, beginning the 12th. The women's is on Wednesday evening, beginning the 13th. And both of those are a great opportunity to dive deeper into God's word and also to get to know other men and women in our, our church community here. It's a great opportunity to learn. Now we're going to switch to windshape camps. Uh, a lot going on with windshape camps. Uh, here you see the fact that tomorrow registration begins. And for the first 50 registers, you get a $50 reduction in the, the cost of camps. There's a QR code there that will take you to the website that will allow you to uh, sign up. Uh, or there's the website uh, in, in writing that you can go to and, and, uh, and get on board with that. We're really looking forward to a, a, a large camp this summer. We keep growing each year because the word gets out. People realize what a great time their children have. So we'll pass the word amongst our friends, neighbors, and, and we're looking for businesses that can help us get that word out, as well as help us raise funds and, and offset the cost of, of bringing in this wonderful group of wind-shaped people that run the camp for us, basically college students, and uh, they do a wonderful job, and the kids have a great time. And it's great work for the Lord. Um, and if you have any questions about that, see Rachel Hazeltine. She'll be glad to uh, get you connected and, and line you up with whatever questions you have. Also on Windshape, next week, March 13th, busy time here in March, uh, we have this second uh, fundraiser at the Main Street Chick-fil-A. So take one of these uh, cards that are out on the table, present this when you place your order, and 20% of the proceeds from that order will go to our Windshape uh, effort here. So that's something everybody can do and, and get your friends and neighbors to uh, participate as well, because we all love Chick-fil-A. It's a great place. So uh, uh, March 13th. So now let us turn our attention to our, our weekly offering. As you know, there's, as we always say, there's multiple ways to give here at Grace Church, so nobody should be left out. You can give by check and mail it in. You can put it in the white box at the entry. And there's a couple ways on our website, graceforgranger.org, where you can also make your, uh, your uh, donations and your offerings. So let us pray. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, we come to you humbly with praise and thanksgiving for all the blessings you have bestowed on us. We give back to you a small portion of that which you have entrusted to us. We pray that you will guide us in the use of these offerings to further your kingdom both here locally as well as around the world through our missionaries. We pray these things in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Why don't we rise and greet those around us?
Good morning. Hello. Hello, Ben. Hello, Ben. Hello. Hi, John. Hey, LJ. I like that. Yeah, you know, I was actually, it was funny because I was thinking when I was sitting down right before coming up, I used to do this thing where I'd say, good morning, and then the first thought would be, good morning, and then I'd say, no, let's try it again, good morning, and then you guys would finally get on, they're like, let's greet each other, let's be excited to see each other, so that was kind of a beautiful moment, I appreciate that, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it truly, I mean, yeah, you know, Jackie said I trained you, I wouldn't necessarily call it that, it's just that I appreciate you guys, I'm excited to see you. And I hope that that feeling is mutual. So if you call it training, you know, call it what you want. Um, But it's it's a good feeling. Um, This morning, we're going to jump right back into Colossians. I don't want to waste too much time because I got a a lot that I want to get through and communicate. Um, We're starting off on a good note because the microphone is working. So thank you uh, to our AV team. Um, We're going to be looking at our passage in Colossians, which is chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And so I want to pray for us all uh, as we get to open the word this morning. All right. Heavenly Father, we just pray that this morning honors you. Uh, It's a beautiful thing to be in your house, uh, to be with people uh, that all just love and have put their faith in you, um, who are seeking you, God, uh, who have made it the purpose of their day to begin here uh, with your people. And so we just pray that this morning glorifies you, uh, gives you the right honor that you are that you are due. God, I pray that our hearts are humbled, uh, that, that that pride is, is has no place here, but that we're humbled and, and the posture of our heart is to be open to hear what your spirit is going to uh, have us to hear this morning, whether it's words that I speak or, or the spirit leading in our hearts this morning. Uh, God, we're thankful for your son. We're thankful for salvation in his name. We're thankful for our complete salvation, which we've seen already in this letter in Colossians. And God, again, we just pray that this morning uh, brings you the glory and encourages us and strengthens our faith. In your son's name, amen. Amen. One thing I realized as we've been getting into Colossians is we, we told you that Paul wrote the, the letter to the Colossians, but I was, as I was writing and, and getting into this, this passage, the heart of Paul really comes out, and I, and I really love that we're starting to see Paul, uh, his, his, his true feelings uh, and, and care for the church, but it isn't going to mean as much if you don't really know who Paul is. And so I can take for granted the fact that most of us have been churched for a while or have been in the Word for a while and may have a, a better understanding of Paul than others, but some of us may not. And so before I dive into Colossians, Uh, chapter 2, I just want to touch base to make sure that we understand who the author, who is God using truly uh, to write this letter. So before Paul uh, was in this place, he he went by the name of Saul, and he was a Pharisee. Um, and, And that really gives us four insights into how he would have seen Christians, specifically how he would have seen Jesus and his teachings. Four for the sake of condensing it to this morning. One is, he would, have had a, he would have memorized the first five books, the Torah, the law, right? So it gives us an understanding of his knowledge of the law. He had a very high regard of the written law, which is the Torah, and the oral traditions or the oral law, which are now, uh, we call them the Talmud and the Mishnah, right? And so he had a very strong understanding of the law, the Jewish traditional law and oral law. And his idea of the Messiah as the idea of the Pharisees' idea of the Messiah, was not Jesus. Their Messiah wasn't born in a manger. Their Messiah uh, didn't, didn't live and walk the way that Jesus walked. Uh, matter of fact, Jesus would have been seen, and we see all throughout Scripture, all throughout the Gospels, that the Pharisees tried to trip up Jesus to see how he's, uh, you know, an, a heretic or how he can be blaspheming the law because, again, that's number one for them. And, and so Jesus to Paul would have been a blasphemous teacher who blatantly lived contrary to the law and the way that the Pharisees saw the law. <clears throat> and lastly this, Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. 
It's a disputed thing. I believe it based on what we read in Acts. But I believe he was a member of the Sanhedrin and even made it clear that it was his mission to do whatever he could to oppose the name of Jesus. It says in Acts chapter 26, 9 to 11, I myself was convinced, this is Paul, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them and even to foreign cities. This is your Paul. A man whose mission was to uphold the law above all things. Jewish tradition above all things. Which meant that this Christ, this Jesus of Nazareth, he was opposed to. And not just opposed like he sat at home and wrote a few things online in opposition, but it was his life's mission to basically, in a small setting, have a genocide of these Christians. This is the guy that's currently sitting in a Roman prison cell writing this letter. This is the same guy who's now his new mission is Jesus, is preaching and teaching the glory of the risen Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. What we need to understand is that God had a plan for Paul. See, in Acts chapter 9, or chapter 9 verse 15, <clears throat> he tells, God tells Ananias this about Paul. He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. God had a plan for Saul before Saul knew it. Even as Saul was in, in opposition of him, even as Saul was the enemy, God had a plan. Amen? And that plan <clears throat> isn't probably what Paul thought it would be. But God had a plan to use Paul to preach and teach. And so we get into Colossians chapter 2. Verse 1. And we're going to read it all here together. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for those and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Now we're going to break this down in a few ways, but the first is, if you recognize in, the, in verse 1, there's a new struggle for Paul taking place. The Paul that used to struggle to renounce, denounce the name of Jesus is now on a different mission. It says his great struggle, verse 29, if you look in, in 129, it kind of continues the same thought. He toils, which is to work hard, to struggle at, to spend energy and time invested, to work. His life work has become to care for the body. He cares about these, these churches. Uh, Laodicea, the church that's maybe nine miles away from the church in Colossians, but for these churches who haven't even seen him face to face. So he goes from a man who's wanting to uh, harm the church to now he's caring about the church in ways of, of, of people that he hasn't even met. Complete 360, 180 actually. Some of you got it. Yeah. If your faith is done at 360, let's talk after church. <laughs> um, no, he's done a complete 180. He struggles for the church. And I, I want to share this. He's sitting in a prison cell, mind you. 
for teaching the gospel. And the heart that we're, we're seeing here is not a heart that's pointing back to his worldly struggle. When he says, I'm struggling because I want to teach, I want to equip, I want to instruct the body to be a healthy body, that struggle for many of us would have been, I'm struggling because I'm sitting here in jail. That's my struggle. I'll tell you, a true pastor's heart shares this struggle. A few Sundays ago, I make the mic joke, but I wasn't happy. It wasn't anyone's fault. But I got really upset. And, and if, you, if you, you know, talk to my family, you know, I carry that. And so we're sitting at dinner that night, and I'm still upset. And as my family was asking questions, trying to encourage, what I got to find out in trying to process why I was upset, I felt like God wanted me to communicate something. And I didn't get to. I felt like the distractions of the microphone and the distractions of the mess that was caused up here because of the mic, it, it took away my ability to communicate what God had laid on my heart for you all. And that, that does something inside of me because I have a care and a passion for you. My life's toil, my life's sacrifice is for you all, the body. I am faithful to the call that God has for me and this isn't to pat my own back, but it's to share with you the Paul that you're reading here who's struggling, who's made it his life's toil, his life's work to instruct and to equip and engage with the church to draw them back to true faith is the same heart that Pastor Art, the elders, and myself carry here for you all. You are cared for in the same manner, and it's a powerful care. If you feel like you're in a church that doesn't care for you, let me just tell you it is just a feeling. We pray for you all. We want to be here to equip you. That's why the word is uh, the foundation of all that we do here at Grace Church. But Paul shares his struggle. And it's directed to the church, not his own situation. <clears throat> it's not his own well-being. But it's his, his, his call to equip the church with truth and firm faith. In verse 2 and 3, he says this, that their hearts, this is why, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Why does Paul struggle? Why does Paul toil? Why does Paul put in the work? Why is Paul willing to subject himself to the, to the Roman authorities who, who, who have put him in prison? Why is he willing to live in that manner, would you? Think about it for a moment. If the situation gets uncomfortable, are you willing to share truth? It's a gut check for us all, but the reality is nowadays... If we feel that we could possibly offend somebody, if we feel like somebody doesn't want to hear what we have to say or what we got to share, guess what we do? A respectful bow out. How little do you value the thing that you have to share if you're willing to just let somebody's uncomfortable uh, moment take over? Do you believe it? If, 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 if a house is burning and I tell them, hey, you got to get out of there, they might not want to wake up because they're in the middle of a deep sleep. But as uncomfortable as it is, the house is still on fire. Don't forget that the gospel message is about a world that's fallen to sin. Amen? We are people fallen to sin. Our outcome is the same as a fire, death, destruction. And if we miss that because we're too busy worried about being comfortable, guess what? You know the result. Paul is not concerned about his own comfort. Paul is not concerned about his own well-being. He's concerned with the very call that God placed on his life when he met Jesus Christ that he was going to use him for the church. The very call 
that turned Paul into Paul. He wants us to be encouraged. I don't know about you, but I remember when I first got saved, the power of the gospel was so body filling. It changed everything for me. Everything. When my heart humbled itself to a place where I could receive that I am a sinner and that I need a savior, it changed everything. It encouraged me. And this is Paul's desire. It's my desire. It's God's desire that we are, the church, believers, are encouraged by the truth of the gospel. The gospel message is not a burden to carry throughout life, and it's not about a a, a message of discomfort. Again, it's a message of salvation to a dying world. Walking out our faith, that that can get uh, uncomfortable. That can come with sacrifice. But the actual gospel message, that's not where discomfort is. The gospel message produces hope, and in hope, you're encouraged. How many of you have been in a place where you don't have hope? That is discouragement. You felt that. And so the gospel message is not a discouraging message, but it's a message that brings hope, that encourages us. The gospel reconciles sinners like you and I who have revolted against God our entire lives, who fought God for his position. Yet we have a God who stretches out his hand and offered his son for our freedom from the curse of sin. That's the God we serve. And the church, this church and and, uh, Colossae, they've been hearing a perverted, a twisted gospel message. And so Paul's drawing them back to this place where, hey, the message that you're hearing that's been twisted, that's been changed, that's not the true gospel, that message will not encourage you. Because that message comes with strings attached. That message isn't about a sinner made free by Christ alone. That message is about a sinner being made free by Christ and then adding A, B, C, D in until you're done. And I don't know about you, but when you think about salvation, when you think about your own work and your own position with the Lord, to add anything other than Christ is a, is a fool's game. It's a fool's game. Paul's encouragement is not just about making them feel good and sending them a letter. It's about repositioning their understanding of the gospel so that they're free from these outside lies, these unnecessary burdens placed on them by people who did not know or teach the true gospel. A gospel that saves both Jews, Gentile, and redeems the world to God. That's the encouragement that the gospel brings, that you can walk out of here with 100% hope in Christ's work. He continues to say in two, as his, as his purpose for his struggle is that we're being knit together in love. This idea of being unified by the gospel. I like that it goes back to really the second of the greatest commandments, to love each other. That the gospel unifies us, brings us together. I want you to look around. I love how this morning started off with the interaction, but look around you. When you woke up this morning, did you think, I'm just going to decide to go to church for me? How many of you were thinking about the people that you're going to engage with, that you're going to interact with when you get here? Yes. Yes. See, we are a body of believers, and and Paul calls us, and God calls us to be unified in that. And what brings us together, what ties us all together, whatever uh, area in life, whatever circumstance in life you live in, is the gospel that we believe in. It's the unifying bond of everyone that's sitting in this room when you feel like, oh, I'm all alone. Nobody knows me. There's a song about that. 
I'm all alone. Nobody knows me. Nobody understands the struggle. Nobody understands what life looks like for me. Nobody understands my fears and my doubts and all the things that want to take over. Nobody even understands the positive things that happen. I am an island. No. Church, as believers, we're unified by the gospel. By the gospel. I hope you feel this way. I hope when you come here, you're not thinking about just coming here for you, but you're thinking about coming here for us, for the body. Paul desires that the church is unified. <clears throat> and you are a part of something even larger than just this place. You're a part of something that many congregations across the, the world, uh, people who have passed and been gone, you're a part of a larger body. In Christ. I don't know about you, but it feels good to be a part of something. They ask retired athletes who have all they've known from AAU to professional, professional sports, what do you miss most? Is it the money, the attention? You know, is it, is it the lifestyle? What do you miss most? And most of them will tell you, I miss the brotherhood. I miss the bonding of a team. I miss being people. I think they say this about the military as well. They miss the people that have the same mission, the same ideas, and doing life with those people. If you don't feel like you have that here, guess what? Plug yourself in. You'll find it quick. And in a church like this, we'll make sure you get plugged in. The laughers know because they're plugged in. They're like, I am so a part of the body, God. I know all the pieces. <laughs> if you don't feel connected, it's an opportunity and a check moment to say, hey, there's a place for me here. And it may not even, I, I always have this conversation. Sometimes people will come up to me and there's things like, oh, what if, what if we do this? Hey, that's a great idea. Go do it. My job and Pastor Art's job, the elder's job, is not to tell the church exactly these are the things that you can do in ministry. We shepherd the flock. We make sure that the, the flock is staying uh, truthful to the, to the word and not going astray. But if you have a call, like God's calling you to do a young adult ministry, to do this and that, hey, guess what? Don't wait on us. If God puts something in your heart, be a part of the body and do it. We're unified in the gospel. We're unified because we have the same Holy Spirit living inside of us all. The same Spirit of God dwelling in us. So when you think of yourself as just your, your single being, understand that you're, you're interconnected because of the Spirit that resides in you. Don't discount, don't discredit the very spirit of God that resides in you as a believer because you just ignore that. But that same spirit that lives in you connects us all. God desires that his church is unified in the gospel because that's where power is. We have some wise people in the church today. I'm not saying old, I'm just saying wise. If you think old, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but there's a saying that goes this way. If you want to go fast, maybe we're not so wise. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. In the same way, here's a church. <clears throat> we're not going to go very far together. Or we're not going to go very far if we go alone. I was just making sure you followed. Because if you wouldn't have laughed, then I would have known you weren't listening. And we would have had to restart. We won't go far if we think that we can do it alone. Our strength comes in our unity. Our strength comes in the gospel that brings us all together whether we're from the west side of South Bend or the north side of Granger or the boonies in the parts of Granger that nobody knows about. It brings us all together. Or if you're from Michigan, because some people, you know, they, <laughs> those people are a little less part, you know. Just kidding. <laughs> There's power in that. 
Be involved in each other's lives. Take time out of your week to make it about we, not you. Take time to encourage other believers. Meet with people. Take time. Bible study. I know for some of you it feels intimidating because you feel like you don't know enough or, or, you know, what if you don't fit in or, you know, this and that or the time. Make time. Guess what? You'll never know enough. The more I study, the more I, I learn, the more I'm in God's word, and the more other people think I know more than I do, guess what I always say? I don't know as much as you think I do. And I never will fully grasp Jesus. And I never will fully grasp God. As much as I spend time in prayer and worship and, and reading the word and studying, there's so much more to learn. And so we can come together in a place like Bible study and provide stability for each other, provide encouragement for each other. When we're learning together too, I love this part. When we learn together, we grow together. If we're all learning all these things that draw us further away from each other, it starts to become visible. But when you sit in a study and you're all learning about something like reconciliation, all of a sudden when something comes in the church where there needs to be a moment of forgiveness, the church body has already tackled that topic and knows how to handle that topic and can be accountable to that topic. And that takes place in a place like a Bible study when we're all together. <clears throat> it's so important that we take time to be with the church. And I'm not just talking about Sundays. I'm just talking about being with the church, doing life with the church. It gives us direction. A body that's fractured, and you can imagine, have you ever broken a bone? just doesn't work like it should. You ever twisted an ankle? It just doesn't work like it should. We're a unit. We're called to love each other and walk in unity under the power of the gospel. The third thing that, that Paul really gets at here, which I think is very powerful, is to reach all the riches, this is again in two going into three, to reach all the riches a full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This kind of connects back to the first point here, but it's about this complete realization, this full realization of just how finished our justification is, just how finished our reconciliation is in Christ. Paul uses the word riches here. And it's a strange word because you think about money, think about treasures, all these kinds of things. But what we can do is understand what he means when he's saying riches is abundance. I want you to have abundance of assurance in Christ. What does that mean? Have you ever had abundance of things? Well, let's think about that. When you have abundance of anything, you start to get a sense of security which turns into confidence. So abundance leads to security, which is equated or turns into confidence. <clears throat> if you aren't living paycheck to paycheck, let me put, paint a picture for you. If you're not living paycheck to paycheck, <clears throat> praise God, then in your abundance, you might go to the grocery store, throwing things in the car, and you're totally fine throwing in a few extra things that aren't on the list. It's not gonna hurt you. There's abundance there. I can go check out. I'm not worried about the few extra things that went into the shopping cart because guess what? I can pay for it. I can afford it. Now, if you're on the flip side and you're not living in abundance, some people do what I call two fish, five loaves shopping, which is I got a lot more mouths to feed than fish and loaves that I can afford. So we're just praying that God's going to do something here in this Martin's you know, checkout right, that there's some miracle sale going on, and that when I swipe my card, guess what, right? When we lack abundance, fear sets in. Uncertainty sets in, and it makes, our, makes its home within us. 
Abundance is walking into a Golden Corral buffet. Are you worried that there's going to be food in the buffet line? No. It'll be there. That's abundance. But if you live in a, a country where you're in a famine and you don't have a, gold buffet, a Golden Corral buffet, are you worried about food? Yeah. They're lacking abundance. And so fear sets in. What Paul is teaching when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to our salvation, is that we can be abundantly confident. The same confidence when you have more money than the groceries cost, that you swipe your card, you're going to be able to pay for it. The same confidence that if you pay for your meal, that a meal is going to come out that you ordered at a restaurant. That same confidence that has no hesitation, no fear, no worry, that same confidence is what he's calling us to have in the complete gospel of Christ. Don't worry about your salvation anymore, church. Guess what? It's done. It's complete. You're totally justified through the work and the the saving work and the sacrifice of the Son, Jesus Christ. If you spend a moment questioning your salvation, guess what? It's for the birds. Leave that alone. You do not have to question salvation. Faith in Christ gives you eternal salvation. You're secured in his sacrifice, in his work. This is contrary to the, what the people in Colossae were hearing. This again, this idea that we've talked about of these false teachings that have come in to abuse, to twist the gospel message to add on to the gospel message, to make it about a gospel message that either, uh, you know, you have to do these things, you know, follow this 10-step program that I've written in my book that you can buy for $59. And you can be saved because there's secret knowledge that I know that you need and it costs $60. No. The Colossians were hearing that you had to follow now as a believer, even though you were a Gentile, you got to follow the Jewish law. So now the gospel is not the work is done in Christ alone, but it's the work was done in Christ, and now you got to complete it. That's not the gospel message. Listen, Paul's writing, but don't confuse this. God wants you to have assurance in his son's work. Let me say that again. God wants you to have assurance in his son's work. When you don't, you blaspheme his son's work. When you aren't sure that that Jesus that you say you believe in can complete the work of salvation for you, you're telling God that sacrifice wasn't good enough. And I don't know about you, but I'm not telling God that. So if the devil wants to tell you in your spirit, hey, you should be worried. You shouldn't be comfortable. Are you sure? Guess what? Get away from me, Satan. Get that out of here. My salvation is secure in the work of Christ, the complete work of Christ. I can be abundantly, abundant, if that's your word for the week, abundantly confident in Christ. Your salvation, God's not dangling it in front of you, right? You're not on a treadmill, God's dangling the Twinkie, hey, just come a little closer. He's not waiting for you to slip up so that he can just take back the gift that he's given you. That's not God. In Christ, we see here, is all wisdom and knowledge. So a world that was telling the Colossae church, guess what? You don't have the full wisdom. You don't have the full knowledge. Paul is completely rebuttaling by saying, in Christ is all wisdom and knowledge. Not these Greek philosophers, not these minds of the time who think that they know, but guess what? They're in darkness. If you feel like you can't trust Jesus but you can trust yourself for salvation, that's a telltale sign that something's wrong. You can trust in Jesus, the same Jesus that Paul paints this picture of, 
the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, creator of all things, before all things, holds all things all together, the head of the church, the beginning, the firstborn of all the dead, the preeminent in all things, the dwelling of the fullness of God, the reconciler. That's the Jesus you can put your 100% abundant, confident trust in. Four and five. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith. This abundance of assurance that we can have in Christ comes against any attack that people want to make bring into your life to distort the gospel message. When we have assurance in Christ, all the doubters and the naysayers and the people who try to muddy up the truth, guess what? They just end up being noise. You can disregard that. Chip Kelly's a a popular college football coach. And he says this, because I I always try to relate things back to the experiences I had with with being on a team and things of that nature, but it says, if you let outside noise affect you, then it means you value their opinion more than you value your own opinion. I want to say it again. I want you to just really take that in. If you let outside noise affect you, then it means you value their opinion more than you value your own opinion. When you place value in someone else's truth, someone else's failed intellect, it devalues the truth, the wisdom, the knowledge found in Christ alone. When someone else's knowledge is superior to the knowledge of God, the order is messed up. When we place someone else's knowledge, a a, a created mind, Above the mind of the creator, think about that, the very creator who formed their mind, but somehow that mind can think above the creator. It's silly when you think of it in that way. We can have confidence in Christ, a complete gospel in Christ. We can ignore the hard hearts because ultimately it comes down to two things. Do you have a heart that's humbled to God to receive his truth? Or do you have a heart that's hard, that is prideful and rejects truth, rejects God? There will be people whose hearts are hard. And then they'll say things like this. I remember I worked on a dock in Phoenix, Arizona, when I was going to school out there. And one of the guys uh, he knew I was going to a Christian school, studying theology. Um, you know, I didn't know at the time that I was going to be pastoring. Um, but I was, a, I, was a, I was an on-fire believer at the time. And if people had asked me questions about things, I'm going to let them know my biblical perspective on things, right? And so we were having good conversation. And he goes, you know what? You just believe because things in your life got hard. And so that was just your fallback. Maybe you heard that. Like, Christians are weak. That's why they're Christians. Because they need a a God to make them feel better about life. They can't handle life. Guess where that comes from? It comes from a prideful heart. Because what they misinterpret is not we are so weak that we need a God. It's that we know we're weak and we know there's a God. (laughs) Right? So they think they know what they're saying, and they slightly do, but it's, it's directed in a wrong way. And so a prideful heart won't receive God. And those prideful heart folks are going to tell you why you're so soft and why you're so wrong. Why you make no sense. But there's a fire. And more and more, the things of this world are being found out. There's a popular celebrity. I don't follow him too much. I know he's like an actor, kind of a strange mind kind of guy, but his name is Russell Brand. He just put out that he is now a professing Christian. I don't know much about him, but I know that if the little that I do know about him, it's kind of a shocking statement. 
People are finding out real quick the things that they trust in, the pride of their hearts that has arrogance towards all kinds of areas in life, that's failing them. That their money, that their, their positions, that their authority, those things are failing them. And their hearts are getting humble pretty quickly. And people are coming to Christ. People are finding refuge in Christ. People are finding truth in Christ. People are seeing light in Christ. <clears throat> Abundant assurance cannot be deceived. When you know you have it, when you know you know it, Nobody can tell you otherwise. Be abundantly confident in Jesus. Only Jesus. He ends it. He wraps up this passage with this in in verse 5. For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit. Again, this this call back to we are unified in the gospel. The same spirit of God that's living in myself as a believer is living in you. It unites us whether we're here, whether we're there, whether we're anywhere. It unifies us. And he says he's rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. When I give you a simple gospel message, here's what I'm not doing. I'm not saying a simple gospel message allows us to do whatever then we want. A simple gospel message makes the work of salvation, the work of justification, only the work of Christ. And now I present myself a humble servant to serve God. And so he's calling, hey, I want the church, I want this church in, in, in Colossae to be an orderly church within the bounds that we've instructed. You can look at 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 40, that Paul lines out this idea of orderly worship and what shouldn't be present. <clears throat> and then he, he finishes with this idea of, I want you to have firmness and faith. So powerful. It wraps this whole idea up. Even Jesus prays for Peter's faith in Luke 22, 31 through 32. Listen, God does not want his gospel message distorted. If you could take away one thing from this passage, it's this. God's desire, God's work was not done so that we could change it. He made the ultimate sacrifice, not so that we could say, hey, I think I'm going to interpret it this way. I think the way I feel about Jesus is this way. He made the sacrifice. He wrote the story. And he wants that story to be true, not distorted. Not adapted, not changed, but it's his story. He wrote it. He's the author. Amen? Amen. See what happens when a microphone works? Hey, we love you guys here at Grace Church, and I'm not just saying that. You guys mean a lot to us. You really are why we do what we do, and it's an honor and a privilege um, to do that. So I want to pray for you all, and I just want to encourage you as we pray, pray that your faith feels abundant. Just as abundant as anything else that's abundant, that you have confidence in that. And as you pray that, when you get out of here today, feel what it feels like to walk with a little bit of confidence, knowing that that thing's done. You don't have to worry about that anymore. That the work of your salvation is complete. Wrap it up. Next page. Let's pray. Father. God, we just praise you, God. 
we, we understand that we have little understanding. And you have all the understanding. You write the book on understanding. And so we pray that we continue to seek you humbly. That our only pride is in the pride of your son. That we're so proud that you gave him to us. To defeat sin. To complete the work of our justification. That takes a sinner like us. And draws us close to you. God, may you get all the glory. May the world, which is all yours, honor you. God, we praise you for minds and hearts that are turning to you every day. And the constant truth and the foundation that we have in you that stands the test of time, that stands the test of all types of leaders and persuasions and philosophies. We praise you for that. God, give us a heart that is abundantly confident in the gospel, your gospel, your plan for salvation. So that in our encouragement, that in our confidence, we can be faithful to the call that you have for us, just like Paul. That we're not spending time thinking about our salvation, but we're spending time thinking about how we can preach that very salvation to others. God, unify us in the gospel. Make us a body strong that can weather any storm. Make us a body that gives you the glory. And we pray that the message you have for us today is one that stays with us and doesn't fade. And again, we thank you. It's in your son's name. Amen. Please stand as we sing this last song. Cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all Forevermore, for endless days, we will 
Thank you, Pastor John. It's been a great study so far in Colossians. Pastor Art did first week, Pastor John did second week, some other person did third week, and Pastor John's back at it. Guess who's coming back next Sunday? Uh, Pastor Art and Debbie will be back with us next Sunday. You know, truth, as John has shared with us and as Paul revealed to us in Colossians this morning, truth isn't found in a woke culture that is godless and lost. Truth isn't found in a politics that's never going to get us where we need to be. Truth is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. Truth is found in a relationship, a saving relationship with our Savior Jesus Christ who died for us. And as John reminded us this morning that brings an abundance into our lives, an abundance of trust, an abundance of truth. And as Pastor Art often challenges us as we leave here on a Sunday morning, we ask and we pray that you would be filled with an abundance this week of grace and peace. You're dismissed.